Hello, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Erica Frischman, and I am a senior business consultant at Catalyst Connection. Today's webinar, we will be discussing soul power, and our presenter is Hannah Alexander, who is the co-founder for Solar Power. Catalyst Connection has partnered on this webinar series, which is called Innovating for Competitive Advantage, with Carnegie Mellon University's Scott Institute for Energy Innovation. For additional information on Scott Institute for Energy Innovation or Catalyst Connection, please see the email or the internet links below. Uh, you can see on the slide, uh, Scott Institute for Energy Innovation uh, works on a number of different activities. Uh, they're focused on using and delivering the energy we already have uh, far more efficiently, expanding the mix of energy sources in a way that is clean, reliable, affordable, and sustainable, and creating innovations in energy technologies, regulations, and policies. Today's topic will be about those innovations in energy technologies. Catalyst Connection is a not-for-profit consulting firm that helps small to mid-sized manufacturers grow their business in the areas of workforce development, operational excellence, and business growth services. For today's webinar, uh, everybody is muted and your cameras are turned off. If you would like to ask a question, we will be at answering those at the end of the presentation. So please type in your question uh, by using the chat function, which should be on the right of your screen. With that, I will turn it over to Hanna Alexander, who is the co-founder of Soul Power. Thank you, Erica, and hi, everyone. Thank you for attending today. Uh, my name is Hanna. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Soul Power. We're a startup based in East Liberty, about three years old, and we are creating wearable energy harvesting devices for charging portable electronics. So today, because we're a startup, I'm not gonna focus just on one topic. I'm gonna try to cover a bit about our technology and applications, but also our path to getting to this point and some of the uh, manufacturing and supply challenges that we've, we've faced getting here. So a bit about our technology. Um, we're a completely mechanical system. Our first device is a power generating insole that charges portable electronics like cell phones, radios, and GPS just by walking. So the way it works is it takes the linear motion in your step and converts it to rotational motion. So we're actually spinning a small permanent magnet generator embedded inside the insole. Um, and it's spinning pretty fast at about 5,000 RPM to generate power. Um, essentially, the more power we can create, the faster and the longer it spins. So we use mechanisms like gears, clutches, links, really mechanical systems to create the power. It's stored in an external battery pack that attaches on the laces, which you can see an example of in that middle image. So the battery and all the charging, discharging circuitry is stored outside the insole itself. So here's one of our first images. We're actually much farther along on the energy harvesting side of the product, the battery pack we're starting to work on now. We've been through about three or four major design iterations in the last uh, two years. Um, and if you have any questions about that, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it at the end. So there's a couple obvious uh, applications for this technology. The first is outdoor enthusiasts, so hikers, backpackers, campers, anybody who's off-grid for an extended period of time and relies on portable electronics for safety and for entertainment. It's also a premium market that gives a lot of great feedback, so it's a really good, robust initial market for us to enter. Secondly is the military. Currently, a typical soldier will carry 20 pounds of backup batteries on a single-day mission. So the military is actively looking for a network of wearable energy harvesting solutions that lowers some of this backup battery requirement. Thirdly, there's an enormous opportunity in developing regions. For example, in sub-Saharan Africa alone, there's 230 million people that use portable electronics like cell phones for daily critical tasks, essentially everything from banking, healthcare, education information. 
Um, and they have no reliable way to charge their phones. So they're walking miles a day to use public outlets or pay per charge kiosks. And our plan is to partner with mobile service providers in the region who see 10 to 14 percent usage rate increases when they provide consumers with an off-grid charger like a solar panel. And then the fourth and final market is consumer electronics. So we all have cell phones, we want them to stop dying. And as we get more efficient, more durable, advance the technology, we'll enter this market. We also have two sort of background visions for the technology. It's not what we market on, but they are goals. Uh, the first is to create this network of energy harvesting solutions. Uh, we have the opportunity to completely pull portable electronics off the grid. And the second is to make people more energy conscious. Um, so we hope that if people, consumers, understand the effort that it takes to create a certain amount of power, then they will also be more conscious of how much energy they're using and wasting on a daily basis. So hopefully to, to sort of incite this uh, behavioral change around energy usage. So currently we've done work in all of these markets um, to advance our, our product. Uh, in the military, we have purchase orders totaling 300,000. Um, they've sort of taken unprecedented funding routes to help us develop the technology in our early stages. Um, they're also a great testing facility. We're working with a group out of CERDEC. Um, it's the power division, so they're used to evaluating up-and-coming technologies. They can give us uh, information about how well our solution would work in that application um, and really help us through the R&D stage before we switch over to uh, heavy military testing and procurement. Um, in the general consumer electronics space, we have over 7,000 online signups on our website. So these are consumers who have seen the price points and have signed up to receive more information. That's also done with zero dollars in marketing. So we know that there is uh, a huge interest in our product and we're really looking forward to uh, delivering on uh, some of those signups. Um, and thirdly, we ran a successful Kickstarter campaign um, in 2013 where we received 480 paid pre-orders and about uh, I don't know, 630 or so uh, backers. Um, and they've been uh, really excellent in providing us with some feedback on uh, what they feel the product should look like um, and uh, helping us with uh, selecting the most important design features throughout our development cycle. We also have a fully issued patent and we are opening pre-orders um, by the end of this year. So our current stage is a testing phase um, because I know there's a lot of people uh, in the audience um, who signed up who are students. Um, I'll talk briefly about this. Uh, typically, testing uh, goes through a few different cycles as you ramp up your, your product. Um, and this is something that software companies can typically uh, afford to pass by um, more so than hardware because, you know, we can't just send out a, an update um, and see how uh, people are liking the update. We have to sort of plan for this and test it in different stages. So when we manufacture, uh, we're not expending a, a huge, huge amount on soft or hard tools before the product is ready to do so. So we went through a pretty extensive uh, R&D phase where we tested with over 50 users with different weights, gates, shoe sizes, um, everything that we felt was relevant to how our product was going to perform. Um, and then we ordered 25 units, which is the stage we're in now. We call it EVT testing. Um, this stage typically does have soft tools for larger companies, but uh, in as a startup, we are um, using non-tooling or rapid prototyping methods to produce those units. Um, and that phase really focuses on functionality and performance of the different devices, making sure that they're all reliably performing as expected and they're performing similarly to the other units in that batch. And after we get through that phase, we'll do a usability uh, testing phase where people will get a more out-of-the-box experience. The, uh, that is called DBT or Design Validation Testing. Uh, EBT stands for Engineering Validation or Verification Testing. Um, so this is actually our roadmap to get to that stage. Um, it's a pretty uh, typical uh, roadmap for a startup, although it would be um, pretty quick for a larger company. Uh, as I said, we're starting with these 25 testable units. We'll then go into 50 to 100 pairs or 100 to 200 individual units um, for usability testing before we make a 10K order yearly. Um, and the reason we're doing that is primarily because of cost of goods. With lower volume batches, the cost of goods tends to be very high. 
Um, it goes down by 10x when we order in the 10,000 unit volume. So we do want to uh, gear up as many pre-orders as possible so uh, when we're delivering those units we can reach that accessible, uh, um, more appropriate cost of goods for larger volumes. Um, in parallel, we'll be working on development of our next device. Uh, typically, the first product that's released isn't quite as good as it could be, and that's normal. You want to release it as soon as possible um, and get as much feedback as possible. So by the time we're getting into much larger unit volumes, uh, we know that we're creating a product that uh, meets all consumers' needs. So I wanted to talk um, a bit about how we got to this point. Um, as I said, we're based in East Liberty, and we have a Carnegie Mellon background, so we took this really great uh, Pittsburgh pipeline to get here. Um, the project actually started off as a Carnegie Mellon capstone design project in the mechanical engineering department, and our professor said um, uh, his design prompt was create a, a product, create technology that solves a problem for students on campus. Um, so this is really the, a core entrepreneurship lesson. You do have to create technology that solves a fundamental problem uh, to be successful. It can't just be interesting technology, which is, is something as engineers we uh, trend towards. It does have to solve a real problem, and you have to do a, a lot of initial customer development to make sure your, your solution is appropriate. So we built the device. Uh, we demoed it in D.C., where we got a lot of feedback from different NGOs, business people walking around, the military. Uh, realized that um, if we captured and stored power in a battery that we could charge a, a wide variety of different devices. Um, and we went to Project Olympus, which is Carnegie Mellon's local incubator on campus that uh, supports students and, and faculty who want to commercialize different technologies. Um, they coached us to get into Alpha Lab, which is a local Pittsburgh accelerator. Um, and Alpha Lab provides office space, mentoring, um, and an investment from the uh, parent organization Innovation Works over a five-month program that kind of does a, a business boot camp um, for engineers and entrepreneurs to, to get their feet off the ground. So at the end of that, we had a functional prototype and launched a Kickstarter campaign. We were successful. Uh, as I mentioned, we had 480 uh, product pre-orders. Um, and that was about $10,000 over, $10, over our ask. Um, but we had the challenge at that point of making sure that the prototype could actually be commercializable, could be manufacturable. And we still needed to go through a few iterations uh, on the device in order to do that. Um, so as you probably know, hardware is a much more expensive endeavor than uh, a software startup. Um, and we needed to be able to very quickly prototype different designs, get it in the hands of potential customers, and get their feedback so we could iterate. Therefore, by the time that we were you know, launching, we knew we had a, a product that was going to meet the end user's needs. Um, and to do that, it was uh, rather difficult without being able to manufacture a lot of our individual parts by ourselves. Fortunately, uh, Tech Shop Pittsburgh opened um, sort of smack in the middle of our time at Alpha Lab. Um, and we were in there the first two weeks uh, learning all the machines. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Tech Shop, it's a uh, machine shop where um, students, really regular people, engineers, um, you don't have, even have to have a, a background in manufacturing or engineering to go in there, but you can kind of go in and have access to a lot of formally costly, unaccessible machines like injection molders, CNC, mills, uh, lathes, welding equipment, they even have a water jet, 3D printers, laser cutters, really anything you'd need to prototype a concept. So we went in, uh, learned all the machines, um, went through two or three different uh, design iterations of our device and made sure it was something we felt could be manufactured. Um, but there's still a pretty large jump between having a, a prototype that we feel is manufacturable um, and executable quotes with a, a known assembly process, uh, something that's validated for manufacturability. Um, so to do that, we, uh, we started off by reaching out to Innovation Works. Um, Afshan Khan at uh, Innovation Works was exceedingly helpful in um, finding local manufacturers that could help us in that final stage of our product development um, to make sure that as we changed individual parts, um, they were manufacturable um, and they could be done by a particular sort of cost-effective process. Um, to do that, we had to go in with a plan, so we developed these sort of four options that um, uh, would, would work for our supply chain. Um, the first uh, here has sort of total control of the entire process, so that's 
uh, going to different manufacturers, whether they're metal injection molders, plastic injection molders, uh, um, can do EDM, laser cutting, really going to everybody, sending them our files, making sure it's manufacturable, and kind of controlling the, the whole process from the beginning to the assembly. Um, and that's in pretty stark contrast to the end where we would find an assembly house who had a network of manufacturers pass off our designs and then um, they would in turn execute on uh, all of the different uh, requirements necessary to, to produce a final product. And so there's, there's kind of benefits to both. Uh, in the first case, you learn a lot about your system. You know exactly how it's uh, going to be made, how it's going to be assembled, how it can be improved in the future. Um, but it's very logistically taxing, requires a lot of bandwidth. Uh, we have a team of five people, and uh, we knew in the long term that that wasn't going to be sustainable. Um, in the fourth option, um, it's comparatively much simpler logistically, but you do uh, tend to lose some sort of uh, information um, about how the product is made. Um, so really, the selection of which strategy we were going to use was completely dependent on, on the volume of units. We have a, a sh quick graphic here to, to show this concept. Um, this is what we used for our EVT stage, so our 25 units. We were sort of heavily involved um, in talking with the manufacturers for each individual component, uh, many of the sourcers, um, suppliers we talked to. Um, so we sort of ran all of these logistics. Uh, this would obviously not work for a volume of 5,000 or 10,000 units. So this is what our strategy will look like uh, as we scale. So you can see uh, we're going from you know having potentially uh, uh, 50 to 70 different contacts we need to maintain to only having you know five or six uh, assemblers um, and sourcers that, that we need to talk to to control the product. And this makes uh, getting it out the door for a small company uh, much simpler, much more accessible. So when we're uh, sort of evaluating uh, which manufacturing partner makes the most sense for us, uh, we look at a couple different things. Um, one is, of course, uh, can they scale with us? Can they use the existing vendors that we used in our EVT stage that we know work well? Um, will they communicate well? We check references. We do a lot of the things that many manufacturers are, are also uh, doing for, for their diligence. Um, and while we're doing that, it can be hard as a, uh, as a small startup uh, essentially to be taken seriously, which is completely fair because you know, if, you, if you think about it, many startups um, may not have funding secured, they may not have a, a proven team, um, but they're learning quickly and are, are communicating well. So one of the things we did was we, we reached out to Innovation Works um, and we had uh, connections sort of made on our behalf. So many manufacturers knew that uh, we were a good partner to have and we had a lot of market potential um, if our investors are sort of the ones reaching out. Um, and to do that we sent, uh, we sent a blurb, um, basically what we were looking for from our partner and that was really helpful in uh, making sure that we were finding uh, someone that was a good fit. So they could sort of give us a quick yes or no, um, save a lot of time, make sure that uh, they could do um, and manage the, the type of processes that we were looking for. This is um, an example, this is our uh, intro blurb that we, we send to uh, manufacturers when we're looking for a particular uh, assembly house. Um, so that's kind of a, a summary. Um, I'm going to pass it uh, ba back off to Erica if you have any questions. I'm happy to answer anything, both about how the technology works, uh, different markets, applications, uh, what it's like running a startup um, or a supply chain. Excellent. Thank you so much, Hannah, for a fabulous presentation. Um, to our participants, please remember to use the chat function on the right-hand side to, to ask your questions. Uh, we do have a number of questions, so Hannah, I will I'll start with those. Uh, first, can you buy the Soul Power Soul now? And if so, how much is it? Or how do you buy it? So right now we have a wait list on our website. Um, that's going to be uh, launched into a pre-order campaign um, within the next few months. So you can go on our website and sign up to receive more information about that launch at soulpowertech.com. And the price point will be $200 for a pair of insoles. Great. Thank you. Uh, what manufacturers give you, are you working with now? Um, we're working with a lot of local manufacturers, actually. Um, 
Uh, it depends on which part of the insole we're actually uh, focusing on. So there's a different manufacturer for the uh, mechanisms inside the energy harvesting device. There's um, a manufacturer for the insole and a manufacturer for the battery pack. So a lot of different local and um, uh, uh, foreign uh, manufacturers for different parts. Okay. Uh, do you have any challenges or hurdles that remain in your development process? Yeah, so as I was mentioning, it's, it's incredibly important to get uh, customer feedback as, as early as possible. Um, to do that, we're going through this sort of ramped up testing cycle where we have 25 EBT units and then we'll jump to that uh, 50 to 100 uh, pairs of, of uh, the power generating device. Um, and I think the uh, sort of the main challenge there is uh, making sure that all of the different units are going to be reliable, they're going to behave as expected, that our, our manufacturing processes we selected are appropriate, and really just getting that out-of-the-box experience, making sure that um, the, the product is, is meeting our uh, both technical and customer requirements. Okay. Are you still looking for funding? Yeah, um, we are looking for funding. We are raising a round right now. Um, that's a combination of uh, investment groups on, on this coast and in San Francisco. Um, we were uh, very successful in finding some seed stage funding um, from Innovation Works, um, which is a, a local economic development firm um, that, that's been really great in uh, funding us so far. Okay. Uh, what is your economic model? Um, you mean our growth strategy or uh, go to market? Yes. Okay, so um, initially we're going to be focusing online. Um, going to retail and finding partners initially is uh, not necessarily a difference in uh, technical development, but it's a whole different ballgame in terms of go to market strategy. Um, so we'll be following a, a path that's very similar to some other wearables and consumer products where we focus uh, primarily online. Um, and we feel that that's a, a good way to start as we improve the technology um, because we'll have a sort of one-to-one uh, -one connection with the end user. Um, and we've also seen a, a good amount of traction to our website so far. As, as I said, we have uh, 7,000 signups on soulpowertech.com um, with no money spent on marketing. Um, as we ramp up, we'll be doing um, a lot of PR asking uh, bloggers in the outdoor space, which is our first market, to review the product um, and, and try to get some uh, really good gear reviews, um, which I think will give people the uh, comfort they need um, in order to, to try the product out first. And Hannah, how are you balancing your student load, um, your workload, with you know, the status of your company? Yeah, so um, initially uh, it, it was quite difficult. We uh, were sleeping on the floor of uh, Project Olympus um, quite a lot, uh, and it, it was a challenge. I, I do sort of feel that uh, to fully commit to, to a startup, um, it is necessary to be 100% focused on that at the time. Um, but it is possible to get a, a great head start on prototyping and on uh, some development strategies while um, you have uh, a school to support you, and um, Carnegie Mellon does a, does a great job in uh, uh, allowing people to, to find that balance. Okay. What advice do you have for student entrepreneurs? Um, I think the, the best advice that uh, people gave us, which we didn't fully appreciate at the time, um, but now certainly do, was that you have to... Uh, get things done before it's perfect. So essentially, um, the, the phrase we use is done is better than, than perfect. It's, it's OK to duct tape something together, to super glue it together if it gets that product um, out in the hands of customers as quickly as possible. And this was actually a mistake that we made uh, uh, pretty early on. We, we tried to wait until we were really proud of the product. And it's just, frankly, impossible to be proud of a prototype. So it's, it's really important to. Uh, be okay with imperfection, um, get a lot of feedback as quickly as possible. Um, definitely, you know, take that, that normal uh, engineering um, design path that we're taught in school, um, but make sure you're stepping through it quickly enough where uh, you can get feedback at every, at every possible opportunity. Great. Is CMU still helping you now that you have graduated? Um, absolutely. So uh, Carnegie Mellon has um, invested in us through the uh, McGinnis Venture Competition and the Open Field Entrepreneurs Fund, which is available to um, students and I, I believe faculty too. Uh, 
our contacts that we met through Project Olympus and um, through Alpha Lab are, are still very much a, a part of the process. Uh, we call them up um, for advice constantly. Um, and yeah, Carnegie Mellon still has a, a network of um, uh, professors, uh, you know, depth of t technology knowledge is um, incredible. So we can always go, go back to our, our former professors uh, to validate our test results or to ask how to solve a particular challenge. Great, great. Uh, just a reminder to our participants, if you have any questions or additional questions, please use your chat function on the right-hand side. Uh, Hana, you told us a funny story before we uh, started the webinar. Uh, how did you become interested in this, this type of technology? Yeah, so it was, it was actually a uh, capstone design course um, in the mechanical engineering department. Um, and the first idea was to put a light on uh, students' shoes so that they could see where they were going at night and the cars could see where they were going. Um, but we needed a way to power this light because we didn't want just another inconvenient uh, consumer product that was going to drain all its battery life and be essentially paperweight in your shoe. So uh, we came up with this energy harvesting concept and uh, demoed it and realized that if we stored some of the power instead of just sending it straight to a light that we could charge uh, things like phones and uh, wearables. So we're actually creating a, a useful amount of power. Um, our power to weight ratio is actually 10x uh, that of the uh, competition. So that's including uh, microfluidic and uh, piezoelectric concepts. Good. Uh, what countries are you working in now? Um, so for manufacturing partnerships, we're working out of uh, China um, for the insole. Um, our Kickstarter actually had 32 different countries represented, so we've had media coverage um, all over the world, uh, everywhere from Japan to Germany to Israel. So, you know, a, a lot of different countries um, uh, find that the, the product is, is interesting. Uh, power is kind of a, a universal issue. So. Um, we've seen uh, interest from uh, m many different locations. Um, the rest of our manufacturing, however, happens uh, domestically. Okay. So who are your competitors now? How do you differentiate your technology from what they're providing? Um, so our main competitors are, are actually uh, not addressing the problem in the, in the same way that we are. So um, there's a couple different types of uh, kinetic energy harvesters. There's swing, there's uh, rotational, like, uh, we use, um, and in terms of broader energy harvesting concepts, there's also things like solar and piezoelectric technology. So um, on the kinetic front, uh, swing generators are actually very inefficient compared to our technology. It's, it's sort of like a, a, the same technology that's used in a watch, so much lower power output. Um, it's created from uh, oscillating magnets between coils. Um, as opposed to uh, kind of taking the full weight of a person and compressing a device into a step. So you get much more power, power out of our system. Um, the solar, you know, it, it works great if you live in California. Um, it was drizzling this morning in Pittsburgh, so obviously, uh, you know, in overcast conditions or with coverage, which is a pretty common um, if you're hiking and backpacking, it's, it's not going to work as well. So we have a, a huge advantage in terms of um, sort of convenience um, and reliability, durability, uh, compared to solar. Uh, piezoelectric technology is, is promising. Um, there's been people working on this for decades and decades. Um, and it, it's coming along. It's still uh, pretty useful just for sensors. It's, it's not uh, ready or uh, it's not going to be ready in, in the next decade for charging larger electronics like cell phones or GPS. Okay. Uh, before I ask you the last question um, that I'd like to hear your response on, just a reminder to our participants, uh, this will be your last opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so please, again, use that chat feature on the right-hand side uh, to ask a question that you may have that Hannah hasn't answered yet. Uh, Hannah, what awards have you personally and the company won so far on this technology? Um, so we had uh, a lot of great press after the Kickstarter com campaign. Um, we also had uh, Steve Case, who's the founder of AOL, come through on a Rise of the Rest tour. Um, and that, the goal of that was to uh, go to cities that um, had some, some great startups, great ideas, but uh, weren't represented on the uh, startup stage quite as much as uh, places like San Francisco. So uh, he came through and we actually were able to win that competition, um, which opened up a lot of doors. Um, so, so far we've won the Popular Science Invention of the Year Award in 2014. 
um, I was named a uh, Glamour um, Tech uh, honoree at the uh, Women of the Year Awards at uh, Carnegie Hall in New York. Um, and we received the Forbes 30 Under 30 uh, Award in uh, Energy category in 2015. Um, and we've also been very fortunate to be able to demo at the White House twice, the first uh, for the 2014 Maker Fair and um, this year uh, as part of the Global Entrepreneurs event that recognized technology that could have a uh, global impact. Well, congratulations, Hannah. Those are great awards to Thank you. have under your belt. Um, so I don't see any additional questions. So Hannah, I want to thank you again for your time today and putting together the presentation. And also Catalyst Connection would like to thank uh, CMU and Debbie Stein at the Scott Institute um, for Energy Innovation uh, for co-sponsoring this webinar and this webinar series with us. So if you um, are attending this uh, webinar today, you will receive a link with a recording as a follow-up uh, as soon as we're able to, to finalize that offering. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to, to email them to Hannah. What, what email would you like them to use? Um, you can use uh, info at soulpowertech.com to uh, ask any questions. Great. Well, thank you again, Hannah. Thank you uh, to CMU. And we look forward to you joining us for future webinars on um, energy technologies.